I got so excited uh, just uh, meditating on the word about the church. Uh, I just had to go glossolalic this afternoon and just rejoice in my spirit about what a wonderful thing the church is. And Matthew 16, verse 15, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom to release everything that belongs to the king on earth. And Matthew 5, 22, uh, excuse me, in Ephesians 5, 22, Paul said that Christ is the head of the church. He gave himself for the church, and he is one with her. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, it says that the church met together continually for teaching and for prayer and for communion and for fellowship. So we're going to talk for a few minutes this evening about what is the church. What is the church? I want to say to you that by and large, the body of Christ is suffering today because they have a very weak theology of the church. We don't have a very clear understanding from the Word of God about who and what the church is. And especially among some renewal movements today, church has almost become like a bad word, especially in reference to local churches. Some people are very quick to dogpile on local churches as spiritually dead or too religious or too political or too hierarchical or too structured or too controlling. Some people think that they sound spiritual when they talk about belonging to the kingdom of God but not belonging to the church, as if you could belong to the kingdom of God without belonging to the church. And I have to say that a lot of damage has been done by people who have never pastored or by people who have been burned out pastoring and now travel around bashing local churches, collecting offerings from believers without ever bearing the burdens of administering pastoral care or pastoral discipline. And the kicker is that most often they use the platforms of local churches to do it. I won't have anybody here at harvest time who doesn't have a high regard for the work of the local church, and I don't partner with any ministries that don't value the local church. Some of you remember our friend Pastor Jamie Dixon from Waterville, Maine. He put up a Facebook post last week saying this is a young pastor. He's in his mid-20s, and he's started, he planted a church when he was right out of high school, and it's grown, and it's doing great things. But he put up a Facebook post last week saying that church. The word church has become too controversial and we need to start a pro-church movement among young people. And you should have seen the thread of comments that followed after he put that up. So I want to talk with you tonight, what is the church? First of all, I want to talk with you about the meaning of three very important biblical words. Three important biblical words. The first biblical word is the word ekklesia, the Greek word ekklesia. Most places in the New Testament where you see the word church, the Greek word in the text is the word ecclesia. That's why in theology, the study of the church is called ecclesiology. The plain meaning of ecclesia is an assembly. Literally, the words mean called out or people who have been called aside to form a distinct group. In regular vocabulary, an ecclesia could be any assembly of people, even an ad hoc mob, the, the mob that formed in Acts 19 and rioted in Ephesus, in Ephesus is called an ecclesia. But in the Bible, ecclesia specifically refers to the assembly of God's people. The second important word that we need to know is the word kuriakos, kuriakos. This is the Greek word from which we actually get the English word church. And the literal meaning of kuriakos is belonging to the Lord. Interestingly, the word kuriakos only occurs twice in the New Testament. 
in 1 Corinthians 11.20, it refers to the regular meetings of believers. So it was their weekly gatherings for worship and for prayer and fellowship, actually daily gatherings, really. And in Revelation 1.10, the word kuriakos refers to the actual day, Sunday. Very early among Christians, kuriakos, or church, became the designation for their meeting places, which they considered holy because of the purpose of their gatherings and because the presence of God met them there. So very early, listen, everybody look at me, very early in Christianity, the word church literally meant we meet in this holy place every Sunday. The third important word to know is the word synagogue, which is, of course, the word synagogue, and synagogue means both an assembly of Jewish worshipers and also the building in which they meet. In order to distinguish themselves from the Jews, early Christians shied away from the word synagogue and they favored the word ecclesia. Only James uses the word synagogue to designate a Christian worship service. So looking at these three important words in the New Testament, what is the church? The church is the people who belong to the Lord and their regular gatherings for worship and fellowship and the buildings in which they meet. So people are actually mistaken when they say the church is not a building. No, actually the church is not only a building. It's perfectly biblical. Listen, it's perfectly biblical to refer to a building such as this one as the church. It's also perfectly biblical to refer to our weekly worship services under the direction of leaders as the church. And of course, all of us who are believers in Jesus are the church. So biblically speaking, I want you to catch this because the local church is under assault. It's under attack today. Biblically speaking, it's nonsense to try to divorce the concept of the church from local expressions of believers meeting regularly for worship and fellowship in places that are specifically designated for that holy purpose. So what I'm saying is the church is local churches and local churches are the church. Do you understand that? Are you with me on that one? So if anybody says to you, well, you know, that's not the church. Yes, it is the church. So what is the church? Let me give you four things as quickly as I can. First of all, the church is a global community that is the unique product of the finished work of the cross and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church is a global community that is the unique product of the finished work of the cross and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The church did not exist prior to Jesus' death and resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Interesting tidbit for you. In the Gospel of Luke, Luke never once uses the word church, but in the book of Acts, he uses that word 24 times. For Luke, the church did not exist prior to Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. In fact, it could not. The church was only made possible by all of those historical events. And the church is God's witness on earth that all of those events actually took place. The Holy Spirit testifies of the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus through his church. Paul said, whenever we gather together and we share communion, we are giving a testimony that Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension have occurred until he comes again. I read those words every time we share communion here at Harvest Time from 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you what? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The church is unlike any other group or any other organization on earth. The church is unlike any other club. It is unlike any other social community. It is unlike any other popular movement. It is unlike any other religious community on earth. The church is a community that was supernaturally birthed by the Holy Spirit 
and it remains tightly connected to one another through the work of the Holy Spirit. What is the church? Secondly, the church is the people who belong to God on earth. The church is the people who belong to God on earth. I haven't looked, but I read that there are over 80 different designations and metaphors in the New Testament for the church. One of them is the people of God. The church is the people who are in unique covenant and relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We are the sons of God. We are the members of God's household. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. Paul said we are the bride of Christ. We're bound to Jesus in a relationship whereby we have become one with him. We are now part of Christ and he is part of us. Paul said this is a profound, the spiritual mystery. The church is the people who are fully submitted to the leadership of Jesus Christ. You can't talk about the kingdom of God without talking about the church. And you can't talk about the church without talking about the kingdom of God. They are part and parcel of one another. The church and the kingdom of God were contemporaneously inaugurated through the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And the church is a microcosm and a harbinger of the kingdom of God on earth. One day, the whole earth will be full of the glory of the Lord. One day, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. One day, it shall be everywhere on earth as it is in heaven. Everyone on earth will one day be submitted to the Lordship of Jesus Christ but right now, the only place that exists is in the church. The kingdom of God is expressed on earth through the church, and it is expanded on earth through the church. The church is heaven on earth, and it brings heaven on earth. The church is the people who bring God pleasure. We're the people in whom God delights. We bring God the worship and the honor and the glory that is due his holy name on earth. I want to say to you that if the church had no other function, if we had no other purpose, if we had no other mission, if we had no other role on earth, simply that function of being priests, ministering to God and bringing him the glory that he deserves would be enough. But the church does have other functions. What is the church? Number three. The church is God's habitation on earth. The church is God's habitation on earth. Another designation for the church in the New Testament is God's temple or God's building or God's dwelling place. God's presence on earth is manifest through his church. You know, God can sovereignly choose to manifest his presence anywhere on earth that he wants, any time and in any way. And he does do that. But if you want to know where you can be certain to find God's presence on earth, you will always find it in the church. Jesus said, where two or three or four or more of you are gathered together in my name, I am there. Jesus said, if you're having a party and you're celebrating me, I'm there. That's why we sing, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Flood this place, fill the atmosphere. And guess what? He does. Through the church, people experience what God is like. While Jesus was in the world, he was the light of the world. Through Jesus, people experienced what God was like. They experienced the love of God the kindness of God, the mercy of God, the wisdom of God, the healing and the transforming power of God. But when Jesus left the world, he said to us, now you are the light of the world. And when the church is gathered together in worship and the presence of God is in our midst, people experience here what God is like. 
They experience his love and his kindness and his mercy and his transforming power. That's why so many times people come into harvest time and they just get overcome. They begin to cry. They don't even understand what's going on and what's happening to them. What's happening? They're experiencing what God is like and the presence of God in the midst of his church. What is the church? Number four, the church is God's current agent of salvation on earth. The book of Acts communicates an important truth that we need to contend for. God's plan of salvation is not yet finished. Salvation history is not yet complete. The work of salvation is not yet done. Now listen, that's challenging a little bit to us because we talk all the time about the finished work of the cross. And indeed, it is finished. Jesus said so before he breathed out his spirit. The old covenant is finished. The payment of the penalty price for sin is finished. The redemptive work of the cross is finished. Jesus' suffering and death is finished. The resurrection is finished. The ascension is finished. All of those things are most certainly done. But listen, God's plan of salvation for mankind is not yet finished. The spread of the gospel to the ends of the earth is an integral part of God's plan for salvation history. Listen to me and catch this. Wrap your brain around it because it should light a fire under all of us. The Great Commission is just as necessary for God's plan of salvation as was the cross. You see, the sufferings of Jesus are only beneficial to those who hear the good news about him and then are given the opportunity to respond. How shall they be saved unless they hear? How shall they hear unless someone tells them? How shall they be told unless someone is sent by the church? Beloved, listen to me. Can I tell you, only the church can preach the gospel. You know what? It's good to hand out bottles of water to the suffering. We should do that. We need to do that. There are many organizations that need to do that. We should do that too. But only the church can preach the gospel. The Red Cross can't preach the gospel. It's good to take up all kinds of humanitarian causes. It's good to, to be involved. It's good, you know, save the baby whales, save the baby seals. They're all, those are all good causes. But only the church can preach the gospel. If we don't preach the gospel, there is no other entity on earth that can preach the gospel. So we need to make sure that in, in our efforts to spread the love of God everywhere, that we don't forget that the main thing is the main thing, and that's for us to preach the gospel. If I give out a bottle of water, it's to open up the opportunity for me to preach the gospel. If I hand out a blanket or a meal, it's to open up the opportunity because I'm the only one who can do that. So we live in a time when God's plan of salvation is still unfolding. It's still being carried out. It's not yet complete. And it's the mission of the church to finish salvation history. Three quick functions of the church that I want to give you. First of all, the church bears witness to the truth. While Jesus is here, he bore witness to the truth. He gave witness to the truth about God, about mercy, about the final judgment, about heaven and hell. And the truth has both positive and negative results in the world. Those who receive the truth receive salvation. But those who reject the truth are exposed to condemnation. Jesus said, if I hadn't come and spoken to them, they wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now, because they've heard me, they have no excuse. Now, Paul says that the church has stepped into that role of bearing witness to the truth. We have taken over that job from Jesus. The Holy Spirit does it through us. And just like Jesus, in bearing witness to the truth, we expose the world to either salvation or to condemnation. 
That's why Paul said we are an aroma that brings death to those who refuse Christ and an aroma that brings life to those who receive him. So listen to me. We can do everything we can to appeal to society. We can do everything we can to be relevant. We can do everything that we can to, to try and open our arms. But to some people, we will always stink. And to some people, we'll smell sweet and beautiful. The church bears witness to the truth. Secondly, the church administers salvation through the proclamation of the gospel. The final step in God's plan of salvation is that the gospel should be preached to every creature, every tongue, every tribe, and every nation. The gospel itself is a message that is full of divine power, and the church is divinely empowered by the Holy Spirit to speak it. Eternal life is administered by the church. It's discovered via the church. It's dispensed via the church. It's discipled via the church. All the blessings and the benefits are, of salvation are mediated via the church. Where do we find personal peace? Where do we find physical and emotional healing? Where do we find wholeness of personhood? Where do we find help to have healthy relationships? It is all delivered to us via the church. And a third function of the church. The church restrains God's judgment through intercession and through restraining evil. The church restrains God's judgment on earth through intercession and through restraining evil. Beloved, I want to tell you that secular society will never understand how valuable the church really is in the world. The church restrains evil. It holds back the floodgates of evil in society through its prophetic witness of the truth and through its prayers. The church holds back God's judgment on earth. Jesus said so in the parable of the wheat and the weeds. He said that God withholds his hand of judgment on the earth for the sake of his precious wheat, his sons and daughters in the kingdom. Remember when Abraham interceded for Sodom, God said even for as few as ten righteous ones, he would have spared judgment on that entire wicked city. And I want to tell you something, God is yet, if God holds back judgment on America, it is because of his church. I want to give you two final thoughts about the church. Two final thoughts, and then I'm going to turn it over to my friend Jeff. First of all this, from the day of Pentecost forward, there will always be a church. You know, no other name on earth has drawn fire like the name of Jesus, and yet his church remains unstoppable. World religions have opposed us, yet the church of Jesus Christ remains unstoppable. Governments have banned us, and yet the church of Jesus Christ remains unstoppable. Secular society has sidelined us, yet the church remains unstoppable. Christians are being tortured and martyred for their faith all over the world this very day, yet the church of Jesus Christ remains unstoppable. Kings and kingdoms have come and gone, and yet we are unstoppable. Empires have risen and fallen, and yet we are unstoppable. Caiaphas is gone, but the church is still alive. Caesar is gone, but the church is still alive. Communism has come and gone, but the church is still alive. Colonialism and the British Empire is gone, but the church is still alive. And if American exceptionalism goes, the church will still be alive. A hundred years from now, it's doubtful that anyone will much remember that there was a company called Abercrombie, thank God. <laughs> but the church of Jesus Christ will still be alive and well. I've read to the end of the book, and I've read that when everything else is gone, the spirit and the bride will still abide. <laughs> One thing I've learned after serving the Lord for 38 years, the church is a lot stronger than people think it is. The church has a lot more resolve than people think. The church is a lot more resilient than people think. 
The church has a lot more ability to remain relevant in society than people think. Give us a break. We've been around for 2,000 years and there's no sign of us quitting yet. The church has a lot more ability to adapt than people think. It's a lot more flexible than people think. It's a lot more sustainable than people think. It's because all of those things don't rest on human abilities. They rest on the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The church is a lot more loyal to Jesus and to one another than people think. If you want to help the church, oppose us. If you want to make us stronger, threaten us. If you want to make us bolder, tell us to be quiet. If you want us to grow, persecute us. Try us and you will discover that we, the church of Jesus Christ, are unstoppable. The second thing I want to say about the church is that you can't be the church alone. You can only be the church when you are knitted in relationship with others. And beloved, I would say this to you, that since the concept of the church cannot be divorced from the expression of local churches, belonging to the church means that you must belong somehow to a community of local believers. If this is all a little bit too establishment for you, fine. Meet with five people in your living room, get a guitar and sing Kumbaya, I don't care. But you can't be the church alone. And our friend Jeff Querfeld's going to come save me and tell us more about that. Welcome, Jeff, while he comes. I was reading a study that said that people who are actively involved in a local church, they increase their average life expectancy by eight years, significantly reduces the use of the risk of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, helps rebound from depression 70% faster, dramatically reduces risk for committing a crime, provides with a lifelong moral compass, and provides children with a caring extended family. Why be involved in a local church? Well, these are some good benefits. But I want to look at Hebrews 10 for a little while, and I've narrowed it down to three things, three, three O's. Local church to be involved is for ourselves, for others, and the outside world. So I want to look at uh, Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. I don't have all the verses written there, but let me read those verses. Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our body, bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The beginning of Hebrews, we see that, that there's a major change. Jesus' sacrifice has really changed the way things were done. You know, forget the sacrifice of animals. Jesus was the sacrifice. Forget once a year the high priest going into the Holy of Holies once a year for the remission of sins. What has happened now? Jesus made the sacrifice, and now we can go directly to him and let us draw near. And Hebrews says, draw near. Go to God. For ourselves, why be involved? First, to draw near to God. We need to draw near. He is there. We don't have to go through someone else. We can go directly to him. Second thing, to be grounded in our faith. To be grounded in our faith. In Ephesians 4, 14, it says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Through the Bible, through the apostles, are constantly warning us, be careful, be careful. 
Not only the devil, but there's other people that are trying to convince you in other things. Be involved in a local church. That will surely help in getting grounded in our faith. Thirdly, to be taught his word for our spiritual growth. In Acts 2.42, it said they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Active involvement in your local church is imperative to living a life without compromise. And that's, you don't see that much. You know, compromise is the name of the game. Eh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Um, without compromise. It is only through the ministry of the local church that a believer can receive the kind of teaching that is necessary for him to stand firm in his convictions. God has ordained the church to provide this kind of environment where an uncompromising life can thrive and his people can live and grow spiritually. Next, to be able to defend your beliefs with gentleness and reverence. 1 Peter 3.15, this one's tough. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We as Christians, we are commanded to be ready, to be ready to defend what we believe in. That we can do sometimes, except when they start calling us, you know, irrational freaks. And then that last part of the verse makes it a little harder, right? With gentleness and reverence. Um, but the whole idea is we need to know what we believe in. We need to know what we believe in. If not, we're going to look at it like Ephesians, like we're getting tossed by the current. Next, to be held accountable. To be held accountable. Hebrews 13 it says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. To whom more is given, more is required. Verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden for that would be of no benefit to you. I am no pastor, but as a teacher, oh yes. If the students only did what I told them to, right? Uh, my work, my job would be a joy and not a burden. And if it was a burden, you know who would suffer? It would be them. So, and this is, this is com not, can't even compare to what this verse is saying. The New Testament also teaches that every believer is to be under the protection and the nurture of the leadership of the local church. Church leaders can shepherd the believer by encouraging, admonishing, and teaching. And in these verses, it helps us understand that God has graciously granted accountability to us through godly leadership. So first of all, the, the local church is basically to build ourselves. That's not good enough. Now let's look at the another one for others. A believer will never reach full spiritual maturity without the assistance and encouragement of other believers. For these reasons, you know, church attendance, participation, should be a regular aspect of a believer's life. First of all, what do you mean others? One of the greatest things in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, it says, but our bodies have many parts. And God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. And here I think a lot of us, you know, it's almost that, that JFK saying, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's the whole idea is the church needs you. The church needs you. You know, God has a unique role for each one of us to play in this body you know and if we're the ear you know what's a body without a, an ear we are all an essential part of what is the church and this is called our ministry and God has gifted and equipped us for this assignment and where do we discover develop and use your gifts it's in the church it's in the church Paul makes it clear that the spirit gives gifts that are intended for the common good and the building up of the church and if we're not using the gifts to serve the local church, we're really not using the gifts as the Spirit intends them to be used. So 
we need to edify ourselves, but we also need to look to others. There's over 50 times in the New Testament, 50 times, where the phrase one another or each other is used. The following are responsibilities that God expects, expects us to fulfill in the local church. Let me go just through these very quickly. One, to encourage one another. And we read those verses in Hebrews. We need to encourage one another. And in Hebrews 3.13 it says, but encourage one another daily, as long it is, as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Well, tomorrow, when tomorrow comes, tomorrow is what? Today. So therefore, I guess this means all the time. Next one, to love one another. First John, dear friends, since God loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. Next, to comfort one another. To comfort one another. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. In that last phrase, once again, it is amazing when you have gone through something, if, if someone else is going through that same issue, God will use that incredibly. But we need to be open and willing to do that. Next, to bear one another's burdens. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you'll fulfill the law of Christ. Next, to serve one another. So the church is not only about me, it's about serving. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Just as Christ said, I am lowly in spirit, here we go, to serve one another. Next, to instruct one another. I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another. And lastly, to be kind and compassionate to one another. And in Ephesians, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. All these one another commandments that we have are to build up unity in the church. I read that the New Testament talks more about unity than it even does about heaven and hell. The whole idea of unity, we are to do everything to preserve the unity and to promote harmony. I'm not saying uniformity. I'm not saying we're all the same, but unity. And we're all bringing all of our special gifts to create this, this body, um, this united body. And then... The, the last part of it is the outside world. The, we have to participate in the local church to be an effective witness to the outside world. I, I think in history, in 1492, when I, when I ask you 1492, the first thing that, we come, that comes to mind is Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Uh, early in that year, early in that year, Spain had to basically build itself up. They got rid of a lot of their enemies, the Moors in Spain. And that was in January. And then in October, now Spain has basically resolved all their issues at home. And then what do they do? They look up and say, you know what, let's explore. The church, and I'm not, please, I'm not comparing the church to Spain 1492. Please don't get that out of this. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, but the whole idea is now we need to look outside to build God's kingdom. Acts 2, 47, in, in the early church, it says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The church, the commission, it goes hand in hand. And let me just say one more thing. It's not about, oh, I, I, need, to, I need to be Joe Bible before I go talking to others about Jesus. We are commanded to do it. And we're given a promise with that one too. You know, if you look at the commission, you know, and I surely, I am with you always. The Holy Spirit will do the job. We need to just be available. And that's, that's what we have to do. You don't have to do, I don't have to know all the answers, and I surely don't when they ask you, okay, why do, why do babies get sick? 
these are the things that come up when you talk to others. You don't need to know all the answers. It is the Holy Spirit that's going to do the convicting. We need to just be available and do it. The Great Commission, therefore go and make, all, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, it says and, it doesn't say then, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. The church needs to be that lighthouse in the community that's pointing people towards Jesus, towards the Savior, towards the one who made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Outside world, we also need to participate in the local church to declare our confidence in God. And if we go back to Hebrews, let us hold unswervingly. It's not leaning one way to, or to another. We need to hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. We need to be a witness. By attending church, we're taking a stand, and we're really revealing where our hope lies in. When we get up, wake up early that Sunday morning, and we go to church, and our neighbor sees us going every Sunday morning or Saturday night, we are demonstrating that our hope is built on nothing else but Jesus. We are saying that to the world around us that God is important, worship is important to us, and serving God is important to us. And if you don't think they're looking, they do look. <laughs> Lastly, it's a visual representation of the gospel. I, I guess I, I realize this is almost like a microcosm. The church is a microcosm of really what God has done for us. When we forgive others, it's just a representation of what God has done for us. And, and that is the church. Um, and in general, we need to participate, not only for ourselves, for others, but really the outside world. And now we're going to take time to talk with our groups, and um, we'll discuss different things about the Bible, about the church. <laughs>